Welcome to this Silicon Web Customers Guild webinar, Cosplay History, with Andrew Liptak. The Silicon Web Customers Guild webinar series has talks by speakers on a variety of topics about costumes and costuming. This is our first year doing it, and uh, we're happy about the reaction we're getting, and we're going to continue. The, these are free to Silicon Web members, and they may also be available to the greater costuming community on a space available basis. If you have feedback or suggestions about future speakers or topics, uh, please send them to board at siwcustomers.org with the subject line webinar series, and we appreciate getting those. This initial webinar series is sponsored in part by a generous grant from the International Costumers Guild, Marty Gear Costuming Arts and Sciences Fund. And it uses the ICG Zoom platform that's available to all chapters and SIGs. This recording, by the way, will be available uh, afterwards. A couple notes on Zoom. If you could please set or leave your video and audio controls on mute. That will cut down on background noise and it'll also help us manage bandwidth as well. So if you could do that, we would appreciate it. Feel free to chat or react during the presentation using the chat feature in Zoom. There'll be a QA period after the presentation. To ask a question anytime during the presentation, type it into the chat window and label it as Q&A. We'll get to the questions as we have a chance. Uh, Andrew has a uh, Q&A session scheduled at the end, so we may hold questions until then, but please type them in and we'll keep track of those. When the webinar is over, please complete a brief survey on your experience. We use those results to help improve future webinars, so we'll appreciate it if you could do that. Let me introduce our speaker. Andrew Liptak is a writer and historian. He graduated from Norwich University with a master's in military history, and he writes about history, technology, and science fiction in his newsletter, Transfer Orbit. His work appears in an impressive number of publications, and he co-edited the anthology War Stories, New Military Science Fiction. He has a short fiction that appears also in Galaxy's Edge. He's also a member of the 501st Legion, which is, of course, dedicated to the dark side of Star Wars. So that's great, too, that he's actually doing cosplay as well as writing about it. His book, Cosplay uh, History, is a deep dive into the origins and culture of cosplay. His work covers a wide swath of its history to reveal where it came from, how it's evolved, and why it's become such a mainstream phenomenon. Visit Andrew's website at andrewliptak.com to learn more about Andrew and what he's up to. Andrew, congratulations on your new book, and thanks for talking to us today about all things cosplay. Well, thank you. It's uh, great to be here and um, always happy to talk about it. It's one of my favorite hobbies and um, it, it's been something that uh, actually this year, 20, uh, 2023, is, will mark the, uh, the 20th anniversary since I started um, dressing up in, in, in kit. So can everybody see that okay? Okay, good. Excellent. All right. So um, yeah, I'm, my name is Andrew Liptak. I wrote a book about cosplay and um, I... Um, I'm here down to talk to you about it. it it's a, it's been a fun journey and a fun project that I, I've spent the, the last several years working on. Um, and uh, it, it's sort of a, um, my attempt at a, a wide, sort of a wide look at, at where costuming came from. And um, I think I have to talk a little bit about where, um, sort of where cosplay uh, or, or where this book came from. Um, and to do that, let me I have to talk a little bit about myself. So um, I started, I got into cosplay way back in uh, 2003 when I was a senior in high school. Um, I had been a, a band kid and for my final concert after bugging my um, music teacher for uh, about six years to play Star Wars, um, he finally relented and we did a sweep for Star Wars. And to make the um, evening a little bit more interesting, um, we decided to try to find uh, some troopers to bring up for it. So at the time I had reached out, I had known about a group called the 501st Legion, um, it hadn't been around for that long, but they had been around, had made enough of an impact so that they could pop up in places like um, Star Wars Insider and, and on um, various Star Wars fan sites. And um, so I you know, reached out to the local guys and said like, you know, hey, we're doing a concert, can we, or my music teacher did, um, you know, can we, you know, 
have a couple of you come up and you know take part and one of them did um, he drove all the way up to uh, vermont from rhode island spent a couple hours in kit and then drove back home um afterwards i you know after the concert i asked him like so how do i get to do this for myself and he ended up um selling me a suit of armor later that summer um it was a, a what we call an fx kit it was a one of the earlier uh, earlier versions of a stormtrooper, not terribly accurate, but it looks like a stormtrooper, and I um, still have it today. It's a, I don't know, a mannequin in my basement. Um, from there, I, I joined the 501st in, in 2004, and um, I was sort of, sort of, kind of act, active for a little while. Um, I had college and um, didn't have a lot of uh, time to do stuff, but once I graduated, I had a car some disposable income and um, you know a suit of armor. So I started to go out to events throughout New England. Um, first to uh, the Woburn Halloween Parade. This would have been October 2007, and then um, just sort of that just sort of got me hooked. I started going to everything I could go to, um, and that meant um, charity walks for various um, move, uh, organizations around the state, uh, around the state of Vermont, around uh, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Um, I don't think I've trooped in Maine yet. A um, couple of the, some of the conventions, and uh, I really, you know got a little bit more involved in the the actual organization and day to day running of the group. I became the um, what we call the executive officer, um, who assisted the, um, the the command the commanding officer for the New England garrison, which covers um, all the states of New England except for Connecticut. They have their own garrison. Um, along the way, I started the Final First Legion's fan, uh, Facebook page and um, sort of grew that for the first, uh, you know, 10,000 people or so, and then sort of handed it off. Um, and then in 2016, I ended up founding a, uh, the, the Green Mountain Squad here in Vermont. We, we did not have a, um, for, for a long time, I was one of only two or three troopers. And after a while, it gets to be a little tiring and expensive to drive from state to state. Um, and, and it's also kind of a pain to just try to get people to come up to Vermont. Um, so um, we, as we started to have some more conventions in the area, I basically started recruiting. And we had one person join and then another person join. And then after, um, New York, uh, after Vermont Comic Con, um, we had about 20 people sign up. And we had about 15 people join. We had, you know, the, the numbers kept growing. Um, the, the new Star Wars film certainly helped with that. And um, it's still around today and it's still going strong. We do a lot of charitable events. We do a lot of, um, uh, we actually earlier last week, we had a, an event with uh, the uh, local Make-A-Wish uh, organization. Um, I wasn't able to go, I, I had, I'm just getting over COVID. So my voice might be a little bit ragged here and there. Um, I was not able to attend that because, <laughs> because of that reason. Um, but it, I'm looking forward to whenever uh, we have another one that we can do. And along the way, um, we, uh, I've, I've done a lot of like troops where I change in the parking lot and, and it's just me. And I've got all the way up to uh, working as a backup dancer for Weird Al. Um, I've escorted Snoop Dogg through Times Square in New York City. Uh, I appeared on the Today Show, um, and I was invited to the Rise of Skywalker premiere in 2019, and um, I was one of the marchers in the 2021 uh, Macy's Day Parade when Lucasfilm invited a whole bunch of stormtroopers to uh, march in a uh, as a unit. So I've had a, a sort of a varied career as a as a cosplayer, mostly with Star Wars stuff. Although over the years I've branched out to some other things. Um, I'm a big a Star, Stargate fan, so I've got some uh, a duty uniform from that. Um, I'm a big fan of The Expanse, uh, and I've, I've got a, a Belder costume, um, and a couple of other random ones that I've picked up over the years. And um, uh, so where this, this book sort of comes in to play is six, seven years ago now, um, I sort of Along with all this, I have a sort of a parallel career as a writer. Um, I worked for IO9, which was a, a, a segment of uh, Gizmodo, or, uh, uh, sorry, Gawker Media, then now Gizmodo. I was their weekend editor and, 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 and um, a research fellow for a while. And then I moved, moved over to a site called Verge. And along the way, I was, I was covering uh, popular culture, um, the history of science fiction, fantasy literature, um, and um, technology, social media, uh, science, um, you name it, interview, in, doing a lot of interviews with, with folks and just um, had started to write about, um, you know, the cosplay and, and you know, the, the file first and things like that. Um, for IO9, I did a series uh, of basically as I, I had bought a new Stormtrooper costume. So I basically started writing about like, all right, here's how you build a Stormtrooper. 
And um, that's sort of how I got in. You have a staccato machine gun delivery that my hearing impaired wife cannot call. I'm sorry, I will try to slow down a little bit. Um, about six or seven years ago, I had um, a, a friend of mine or a, an acquaintance in the publishing world had gotten in touch. Uh, Joe Monty of Saga Press is, is a uh, is the, the publisher I, that published the book. He got um, he got in touch because he had gone to San Diego Comic Con and had met a 501st member who had marched um, 501 miles from Northern California to San Diego. Um, his wife, he, the the trooper, had lost his wife due to cancer, and he was looking to raise money uh, or raise awareness for for uh, a couple of causes related to that. And um, Joe reached out and we had a chat and was like, you know, is there a story here? And um, well, I, I thought so. I, I mean, I'm a little bit biased at being a 501st member. Um, and I was like, yeah, I was like, you know, there, there's this, um, it, uh, the, the group had been around for a while. There had um, been some, uh, you know, it had grown from just a, a handful of people and, and sort of scaled up to the, the numbers that we have now, which is more than 15,000. Um, and and um, we started working on how to how do we you know what what is the story for this? Um, so originally the book had been we had thought about the book as as a history of the 501st Legion, and as we had started to put it together, you know I, I realized that you know we need to put the 501st in con in the context of what is the larger cosplay movement. So some early sections became bigger and bigger as I did a little bit more research, and you know as when it, we I had to. Put the book away for a little while and came back to it and um, sort of repitched it as you know a much larger history of cosplay, uh, um, recognizing that you know the final first is just one small part of this much larger world and um, it's uh, so it, it's a uh, that's basically the the origin of the book. So it is it is fairly Star Wars heavy. Um, it, um, some people have have been delighted by it some people have been sort of com have complained about it but you know this is the sort of the product of, of my upbringing within this group and um sort of my work as a journalist and I've, I've tried to sort of keep it sort of a large um sort of a a broad a, a broad overview that can appeal to to costumers and to you know people who are not really sure what cosplay is or what just sort of heard about it on the on the sidelines so that's sort of my my disclaimer for for this given that uh this group in particular probably knows a little bit more than um, some of the other groups that I have I've, I've talked to or um, some of the other signings I've, and, and talks that I've done. So um, I, I've tried to sort of tailor this talk a little bit towards that. So, um, all right. So that's that's basically the story of the book. Um, and uh, let me see. Okay. So the, when, when we started to sort of reflect you know, look at the the much larger story of cosplay when I started to really, um, oh, hey, 1975, excellent. There are Norwich people everywhere, which is delightful. Um, put a pin in that, I will come back because I have some other fun, I have a, kind of some fun Norwich, um, Star Wars related stories. Anyway, um, when I started to sort of figure out how do we, uh, you know, what does this book look like? And what does this history look like? Um, the sort of kept, kept coming to the question of, uh, you know, why do we, why do we do this? Um, but also how has the, the image of cosplay changed over time? When I started doing this in, in 2003, and certainly in the decades before, you know, this was not a, what I would call a mainstream activity. Um, it was sort of like the, uh, you know, the, the, it, it was just not something you saw a lot of. It turned a lot of heads and some people were sort of scratching their head like, you know, why would people do this? In the time that I've been in the 501st and, and been trooping all these years, you know, I've, there's been this real tidal shift towards uh, mainstream acceptance. And you see that through in a whole bunch of ways, whether it is, um, you know, just the massive growth of San Diego Comic-Con or the just the fact that there are conventions all over the place, whether they're traditional um, literature con cons or co like, you know, a little uh, Comic-Con that your local library might hold or just some of the bigger regional ones that have grown um, over the years, you know, it, it's this, there's been this huge shift. And so that was one of the things that I really wanted to explore is, is um, how, how did this become a more mainstream phenomenon and how did it, um, you know, how, did, how does that sort of tie into like, um, how we relate to properties as fans and what does that mean for the larger entertainment world in general? Um, and along the way, 
looking at like how does technology affect this? How do things like um, social media platforms affect it? And so that's sort of where we started with the book and sort of trying to un uh, you know tease out this history and sort of figure out where where it uh, came from. Um, and then sort of in order to do that, I wanted to go even further back and sort of explore like why are we dressing up in costume in the first place? Um, so the book itself goes, we you know I, I try to like follow the trail of of how did how did costumes come to come about um, you know eons ago um, and. It's because it, it's not really a, um, you know, it's sort of an added experience to like how we go about our lives. And so, we, you know, you look back to antiquity, you find people have used costumes in theatrical performances or religious performance, uh, religious ceremonies. And, um, you know, as you sort of go up the timeline, you, you find that there is this um, shift and evolution of, of how costumes were um you know utilized whether you know uh whether they were there for theatrical performances or 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 otherwise and it's basically just a way to, for people to relate to a story um so you have a, a sort of an increasing trend towards realism if, if you look at the, the broader uh, theatrical uh, history of theater um if, if you take that all the way up to um, hollywood and cinema and, and whatnot um but it basically what what you're finding is that you know people are trying to relate to these stories um through the act of costuming and that's sort of the, the best definition i came up with for you know for cosplay and, and why we do this is that we want to immerse ourselves in these worlds um one of the the earlier sort of aha moments for me here was that there's this um early reenactment um that was taking place in england and uh, the tournament of englington and people had um you know they were distressed at at the, the perceived lack of pageantry and the lack of tradition that sort of this modernized world was embracing. And they wanted to sort of go back to the, the, the stories of old and try to um, bring them, you know, find a way to sort of immerse themselves in that world. So they set up this tournament. Um, 18, uh, I, I misplaced some notes. I don't have the, the actual um, date off the top of my head. I have it in the book here. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, mid 1800s. Um, uh, somewhere here. Anyway, um, they these guys spent a lot of money trying to um, get this um, this tournament off the ground. They rented these these suits of armor. Um, they planned out an entire um, schedule of festivities. You know, hundreds of uh, you know tens of thousands, hundred thousand people showed up. Uh, in Scotland for this, and it poured buckets the entire weekend. Um, the painting here is, is a bit of a, a depiction of, of what one of the few fights that they were able to undertake look, might have looked like. And um, um, But it, I, to me, it was an illustrative example of how people were trying to relate to stories and, um, you know, bring this stuff to life. So it's not, it's not really what I would call cosplay, but it, it's, it's certainly like a, a close cousin to, you know, the modern version of it. You're, you're trying to immerse themselves by putting themselves in that world. Um, other examples of costuming, uh, and I sort of meandered a little bit um, looking at, you know, what are some other examples here? Um, you know, the, the suffrage, suffrage movement um, in the early 1900s, you know, people were, women were dressing up as Columbia, Joan of Arc, um, and other, you know, these, these other his, uh, heroic historical figures um, trying to make their point, um, you know, as, uh, as, as a sort of a, as a during these protests and the, these these marches. Um, you see a lot of examples of this um, throughout throughout history, um, whether it's um, uh, um, the, the movement like this or even up to the modern day where you have uh, folks dressing up as handmaids from The Handmaid's Tale or um, um revolutionary war soldiers uh, at tea party um uh, protests so um those are sort of real world examples um you might recognize this guy this is uh, mr skygack of mars and this was an early early example of of somebody dressing up as a character as a fictional character um just because they, they like they like that character um, there's a couple of examples of this um for those of you who don't know mr skygack was a cartoon a newspaper cartoon that was uh, distributed throughout U.S. newspapers in the early 1900s, and it was basically a little alien who was taking these very um, literal notes about human behavior, and um, basically had a white smock, had a, had a notepad, and a, a, a sort of a, a 
a long elongated he uh, head with goggles. And there was a couple of examples of people who had dressed up as this character. Um, one of them was um, at a skating party. Another one was um, sort of advertising for a business. I think they were arrested. Um, but these are like a couple of examples of people just sort of dressing up in costume. And um, it, was, it was a very kind of a neat sort of touch point. There are some others that take place earlier in, uh, earlier in like the late 1800s. Um, Jules Verne held a costume party at his house and people showed up as his, dressed up as his characters. Um, there was a bazaar at the Royal Albert Hall in London um, called the Vril Yab Bazaar. And people um, had dressed up as characters from, um, it was based off of, a, of an old, um, or a, not old at the time, but a, as a science fiction novel. Um, the uh, can't remember the name off the top of my head. Anyway, um, they, they had dressed up um, as characters from that book. Um, and uh, like, you know, figures like um, Arthur Conan Doyle actually dressed up as his, his own characters at times. Uh, Professor Challenger was a, a, one of his favorites and he had, he had dressed up um, as him at, at various points in time. So there's examples throughout of, of these early examples of where people are trying to relate to these stories by, by donning the, their, their costumes and, and becoming the characters. Um, and um, another early example is um, Halloween. As this said, uh, you could have, do an entire talk about the history of Halloween, but just you know, very briefly, like there, there are um, lots of sort of precedents throughout history of, of people dressing up in costume. It was, it was a uh, early on, it was a sort of a trickster type of holiday, and then it sort of it has evolved with time. These characters here are, are actually um, uh, Thanksgiving, or we're called Thanksgiving masker, masters, maskers, and they um, were from the New York area, and um, for a while. Dressing up and trick or treating was sort of a hollow, was sort of a, a Thanksgiving thing, especially in New York and um, the sort of the, the northeast of the U.S. area. Um, kids would go out. My my theory is that parents sort of kick them out to get out, get them out of the way, and they'll go up and down the street, knock for uh, knock on the door, asking for pennies or apples or candy. And if you didn't give them what they wanted, they would hit your door with a flower full of sock of uh, uh, sorry, a sock full of flour, um, sort of presumably to mark you as somebody being stingy. Um, this activity sort of migrated over to Thanksgiving, um, in part because these kids were kind of disruptive, um, but also the, there's a Macy's Day Parade that sort of popped up in the New York area. And, um, you know, after the post-war years, uh, candy companies really were able to sort of um, emphasize and advertise sales for candy around the, the, uh, the Halloween um, uh, holiday, and that's sort of how it shifted. And this was a, just, I, I, I wanted to include a bit about Halloween in the book because it, it's where, you know, a lot of people have, it's their first encounter with costuming. You know, as a kid, you dress up and you get to, you know, be this character for a night. Um, and a lot of the cosplayers that I spoke with for the book, who, um, you know, found that this is really how they, they got in, they got the bug in the first place. And then they sort of came back to it later in life. And then that's sort of, this has sort of been a, a, a quick overview, but this brings us up to the modern, state of, state of modern fandom, uh, World Con 1939. Forrest Ackerman and Morojo um, dressed up as two characters for that Worldcon. Um, it was not a something that I think a lot of people were expecting to see. They sort of showed up in New York City and expecting just to talk with their favorite authors and editors and fellow fans about the, their favorite stories. And here are these two weirdos who showed up um, in these weird clothes. And um, that's sort of where the modern, you know, at least where a lot of folks will point to as the modern state of, of cosplay having its origins is, is it you're, you're at a certain place, you have fans who are like this, this particular character, and they dress up and, and go and interact with their, their fellow fans and friends. And um, that's sort of where this all gets started. Um, and then you do it again, and you do it again, and again, and again. Um, if you do something cool the first time, it, it's neat. But then if you can do it again, it, you can repeat the experience and keep it going. That just shows that there's, um, that there's something to it. So science fiction, the, the, the folks who went to Worldcon went to Chicago the next year, and Boris showed up in, in uh, costume again, and a whole bunch of other people dressed up in costume. They, they ended up... Um, having a little bit of fun on the streets of Chicago. Um, the photo on the left, that is David Kyle, I think, and his wife. Um, we had, I had somebody who had um, donated a, a 
let, let us use a whole bunch of, of early photos. I think I'm trying to remember who that came, who that um, picture came from. It was uh, John Coker the uh, third was was a was a somebody who I had gotten in touch with. And he had a, a large um, catalog of photos that he was able to let us use for the book. That's where a lot a lot of these uh, came from. Um, and um, uh, Mike Resnick, uh, some some of these photos also came from the collection of Mike Resnick, um, who um, had actually published a short story of mine, and I had gotten in touch with his widow, and um, she was able to send a whole bunch along as well. Um, so anyway, like what um, the fact that people were showing up to conventions again and again and again um, really sort of shows that this is a, this idea that had a lot of appeal. Um, people initially these um, these these mass grades were not like it was not um, a, a formal bit of programming other than just you know hey we've reached the end of the weekend let's have some fun in costume and it was basically just a costume party. Um, by the third or fourth world con um and as you, as you get into the 1940s and 1950s it became a little bit more of a formalized thing it became more of a contest people uh, where you started giving out sort of joke prizes it became a more uh formal thing and and um that it became a, a sort of that pillar of the world con community is the masquerade um i want to say this is pacific con so this would have been the third or fourth uh sorry fourth or fifth um uh, World Con, and um, you know, it, it, it. This is sort of where the core of this activity really gets um, started. It, it it becomes a formalized part of the World Con community, and part of the uh, sort of the the just a, it's something that you begin to see at conventions. Um, you didn't really see costuming. It, it's still not quite costuming as you as you have it today at like a at a big Comic Con or or something like that. Um, but it, it it's. It's still a, a fixture, and you still have people showing up. They're they're building costumes um, where they might have just sort of thrown one together in the early years. They're now spending more and more time getting them thrown, you know, put together, and, and um, really investing that time to to make them look really cool, or or, or try to de de design or develop new characters as time goes on. Um, and you have you know the International Costumers Guild comes out out of that. Um, you have you know these much more elaborate um events coming up at, at conventions and um you have people who are you know whereas they might have people might have come to world ton um just for the the, the books and the, the short stories they're now coming because of the, the costuming element so that's how the, this sort of evolved early in this in this um you know world's cons history and it you know it becomes this picture um yes that uh i and i actually I, I don't think we use this picture in the book but yeah there was a um I, when I was going through images earlier, I was like, oh, that's, that's who he, that's, that's, um, he seems to have recycled uh, some of his, his cost, uh, costumes for a while. Um, along the way, you, you're starting to see some of this stuff change and branch out and um, adjust as new people come to it. Uh, this is, this image is of, of uh, Paul Anderson um, at his home in um, California, and it's one of the earlier, um, the Renaissance fairs, and this was sort of this is a you know the group that came to sort of broke off you know, broke broke off, but it was sort of part of the same sort of science fiction fantasy scene. Um, they, it basically started as just holding these um, events at their at his home, uh, along with some friends in the Bay Area, and it became this much larger organization, um, which is now the SCA, and this sort of um, dealing um, medi medieval and Renaissance uh, uh, costuming. Again, this. People will, you can argue a lot about what, what are the confines of costuming and, and cosplay. I, I like to think of this stuff as a much broader, uh, you know, or at least, at least my, how I've come to sort of look at cosplay is it's, much, it's a very broad vocation where you are relating to a story through the art of cos costuming. And so maybe cosplay, is, if, if it's sort of dealing with fictional stuff, you have all these sort of close cousins. Um, so. We, uh, you know, I wanted to include some history of, of how the Renaissance fairs came in because you know you are dealing, you are you are interacting with a a type of story, whether or not it's it's somewhat fictional or non-fictional. Um, there's also a chapter of the book uh, where I talk about um, um, reenactments, um, particularly Civil War reenacting and World War II reenacting, um, because you know you are people are trying to engage with this this historic story. It's it's still a story. 
So, um, you know, this this is uh, is sort of an offshoot of the of the um, science fiction fantasy um, fandom. Getting up into the 1960s and 1970s, you have uh, another big sea change is the introduction of Star Trek. Um, certainly, Gene Roddenberry was was familiar with the world of of, of fandom. He um, premiered um, an episode of uh, the I think the pilot episode of Star Trek at one of the um, I think it was in Ohio. It was uh, one of the uh, the world cons, um, and he brought costumes from the from the the production with him. He, there, I have some some pictures of of uh, people that he brought with him that were dressed up as, as these characters uh, when they screened them. Star Trek really appealed to a lot of people, and it, it really sort of broke um, science fiction into the mainstream for the first time. People were maybe not if they had not read the, the magazines or the novels, they were you know, tuning into their local TV station and, and finding this TV show and, oh, I like this. And, you know, they sort of get into it as this, this way. Um, one of the, the folks that I spoke with was um, Astrid Baer, um, who had uh, been an earlier, uh, and I, I don't have a picture in the slideshow of her, but she had sent along a couple that did make it into the book. Um, she had, um, when I when I spoke with her about this, she was talking about how this period was a, one of real change for how costuming was used. There was um, a couple of conventions where you started to see people dressed up as Star Trek characters just out normal, you know, all over the place. And um, they were, you know, out, they, she referred to it as hall costuming. There's also um, SCA folks who were, who were um, uh, there, was, there was some convention out in California and I, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it right now. But they had um, they had brought a whole lot of SCA people to this con, and they were also walking around the the um, the, the convention in, um, in 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 their in their gear, and so that this sort of was a uh, yes Bay con that 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 sounds about right to me. Um, and um, anyway, um, so this is sort of a, a point where you start to see what I what I have begun to think of as the more modern version of of cosplay showing up at conventions you know people are not necessarily there for panels or for um you know author signings or readings they're there to sort of show off their costumes and um you know this is also a point where you start to see fandom sort of fracture into sort of its own little um fiefdoms um star trek fandom it became its own juggernaut um th these fans they made their own uh fanzines they had their own conventions and certainly costuming was a part of those cons from the get-go, um, I want to say the, the first Star Trek convention was held at a library in, in uh, New Jersey, and then there was another bigger uh, version that was, took place in New York City. And there's um, people showed up in costume all um, at both of those, and 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 from there. So there was, um, you know, this is where you start really start to see, um, you know, these a, a new facet of modern fandom sort of come about that we we have today is where you have these sort of different types of these different strands of fandom that pop up. You can be a Star Trek fan or a science fiction fan or a Star Wars fan or any, you know, pick any franchise and um, go from there. Um, Star Wars is another example. And this sort of gets back to, to my, um, to, uh, you know, my world is, is um, Star, Star Wars sort of blew the doors open even more um, by introducing a, a much, much wider audience um, to the, to the, um, uh, science fiction fantasy and um, you know again people who might not have picked up magazines or been part of the world kind of community were now taking part or seeing science fiction for the first time and a lot of them you know especially kids were like hey I want to go and um, you know be part of this so they started to make up their you know to make their own costumes um, independent of some of these um, you know the world con uh, community uh, the the woman on the the left is uh, TJ and uh, I unfortunately did not get a I was not able, able to track her down to chat with her, but um, I've, I've come across some, talk, some folks who had, who had written about her experiences, and she had basically gone to the theater several times and basically made that from scratch in 1977. Um, and same thing with the guy here on the right, um, and whew, names, the name just blew right out of my head. Um, he uh, actually interviewed him for the book, and um, he was basically explaining to me that, like, you know, I, I went, and it was a revelation, and I was just um what he would do is like i want to make one of these characters so he went to the theater took a notebook 
and started sketching down stuff whenever you know the characters came online. So he built a Stormtrooper, um, he did a Darth Vader, a Jawa, and eventually with some of the later films, he did um, a Boba Fett, some other ones. And um, sometimes he would get so immersed in the film that he would um, forget what he was doing and then have to, oh, oh darn, I have to go watch the movie again. And went and eventually uh, um, you know, made these, these pretty fantastic characters. Uh, yes, that's that's Rhea. Um, and he, uh, unfortunately, he passed away um, a couple of years ago. I, I had interviewed him and um, just, um, I just, uh, I, was, I was sad that he wasn't able to, to sort of see the book, but he, he was a great guy to talk with. And I was, I was very sad that, uh, at his passing. Uh, I met his um, cousin at San Diego Comic-Con last year when it was a, a, a really cool moment. Up to 1980s, 70s, 80s now, um, you know, this is where we start to sort of see the word cosplay come about. And there was um, the, the Los Angeles World Con was um, sort of where this was coined. There was a, as a Japanese fan who came into the United States to cover it for a fanzine and was trying to sort of figure out like, how do we, you know, masquerade doesn't quite cover it. Costuming doesn't quite cover it, so he sort of put the two words together, costume and play, and, and as a um, as a mashed up word, and um, that's sort of how where that um, that phrase comes from is this. Um, oh, cool! People are people know who these these folks are. That's that's excellent. Um, <laughs> um, the sorry, I I sort of lost my train of thought there. Um, he he had basically been he was writing for these fanzines back at back at home and trying to sort of. Um, Give it a give it a sort of a, a good name for them to use is the best describe it, and so that's sort of where cosplay um, it's the, the term cosplay comes from. And it, it I know when I first started with the Bio First Legion, cosplay was not really a, a lot of people really resisted the term. They they didn't it was it was very associated with Japanese um, cosplay and anime, or sorry, very associated with with Japanese anime and anime conventions, um, and they were just. It wasn't quite what the folks at the 501st were really thought on themselves as, as. A lot of them have come around to that term over the over the years, um, and but there's still some people who are not, you know, it, it's this not what really what they describe themselves as. Um, but what I've always found this to be interesting is that this sort of shows that there is the what has emerged out of this environment is these different experiences and these different entry points for folks to to. Um, Come to this hobby, whether it's through Worldcon, whether it's through um, anime cons, or through um, you know groups like the Five Firsts or others. Um, how anime became a, a, a popular, uh, you know, mainstream thing here in the U.S. is it sort of falls with what Star Trek did. Is that you know a lot of um, television stations throughout the U.S. needed cheap content to to broadcast, so they were able to sort of get uh, import. Um, Japanese anime to the United States and so kids would watch it and like oh this is different than anything I'm seeing I really like it and so what you what you eventually see happen is that you have people who are watching it on television but you're also having people who are recording it there um, especially in the 1990s you have folks who are um, forming clubs at schools you are having um, their own dedicated uh, conventions popping up around um uh, um, around the country and um, you know this is it becomes a, a more you know another one of these sort of um, uh, you know another fandom that has sort of joined the much larger world of fandom and so you're it, it's, it's basically just you know it's another, it's another group of people it's another population that has sort of joined up all right where are we at? all right so now up to the mid 1990s, um, and this is sort of where I come in. I come in as, as, as my story is with the Five First Legion. Um, this, this, the story of the Five First it starts in 1997, with a guy named Alvin Johnson basically gets a, a suit of armor um, and shows up at his movie theater. He has a, a bit of a, a tragic backstory. Um, uh, he had uh, lost his leg uh, in, a, in a motorcycle accident, and it was it was having a, a really hard time with it. And, you know, mid 1990s, he, a coworker knew that he was a huge Star Wars fan. It's like, you know, he's trying to cheer him up. He's like, you know, well, the, the films are coming out. Um, you know, it's in 90, 1997. Like, well, how about we do something really special? Let's, you know, I've, I've, I've heard about people who have dressed up as, as armor or who have dressed up in armor. And, you know, maybe we can find some and we can, we can dress up and make it cool. So, the, 
all right, let's go try to do that. So they basically went and started to comb through message forums um, and they eventually found um, a couple of suits of armor and basically began to assemble them. Um, they paid a, an exorbitant amount of money for them. It's like a couple thousand each. Um, but for when when the um, this, the first special edition hit theaters, Alvin was there in armor and you know blew the crowd away. And then um, the next release of the Empire Strikes Back, his buddy Tom joined him, and that's sort of when the light bulb clicked for for Alvin, and he realized that like, well, this is a if you've got one stormtrooper, you know, it's a one off. People think you know that this is a cool thing. If there are more of us, if we have a whole group of us. It, the, the effect that it has on a crowd is so much greater. So let's try to find more of us. Um, he ended up going to Dragon Con in 1998. And this picture is, is of that first gathering um, where they had, uh, you know, a whole, a whole platoon of troopers. And then basically this was at the, the costume contest. They marched Leia in and uh, basically said that they, they blew the doors down. Um, the the Leia in the middle is uh, Sherilyn Lambeth. Um, she had also, at, along the same, had sort of the same line of thinking as Albin. And and for the Return of the Jedi the same year, she had built a um, a scout trooper uh, out of cardboard and um, um, sort of found the group through like you know sort of word of mouth. What Albin did then is he set up a website and basically sort of had this sort of fictionalized version of of a of a stormtrooper on the Death Star, deployed somewhere, and just was writing down his misadventures. And then another person's like, oh, I've got a set of armor, and I've got a, I've got a costume. Can I, can I be part of this website? And um, they sort of went from there, and it, it basically started to grow and grow, especially as they start, kept going to these conventions. Um, not everybody was first on board with the idea of creating like a, a big overall group. Um, some of them just wanted to sort of show up in costume, and that was it. Um, but Alan really sort of worked at it, and, and he was he was sort of hunting for events to go to, um, you know, going to um, celebrity um, appearances at comic book stores or or, or things like that. And um, certainly, with um, when um, the Phantom Menace came out a couple of years later, um, there was sort of more opportunities for them to do that. So that's sort of the the seed of where the where the Bible first started from. And the this whole this whole part of this organization comes out of a of, of a, a slightly uh, another another sort of prop replica strand of cosplay um, with the replica props forum and some online um, so an, an online site where people had basically begun to gather just to sort of like I want to make you know these replica parts or I want to I want to find a costume or I want to learn how to make a costume and that's sort of where the the technology element um, that I, I you know comes comes to the forefront for you know how does cosplay become a mainstream thing. Um, it's these sort of these online gathering points where, you know, you don't have to be, you know, right, you know, in the same town as somebody to, to be able to do this or you um, rely on like mail or, um, you know, just the, the, the infrequent gatherings that, that a convention represents. You can now spend a lot more time sort of researching and um, chatting with people about how to do this. Um, and that's sort of a, a sort of for, a forerunner to what we have today with um, either the, the file first legion forums or the um, uh, other, other like the uh, uh, anime.com or um, other the whole, you know, constellation of other conventions that are out there. Or sorry, other um, websites and forums that are out there. These really help connect people all over the world. Um, not only just um, to share tips, but also to share expertise, to share build pictures and threads, and um, sort of show their progress as time goes on. So that's sort of. Um, where the 501st is coming in. And, and as with time goes, it, it becomes this much bigger force within the, within the cosplay, um, within you know, the, the fandom and cosplay world is you have this, these folks who are doing, going out and doing these very high profile public, um, um, these are, you know, very public appearances that are not necessarily out in conventions, but you know, out in public. And that sort of is a, you know, a, a one, one, way that we start to see this become a little bit more mainstream as time goes on um without we would at, within our, our group as a final first we do parades um we would do uh book releases uh with whenever there was a, a, one of any of the gazillion star wars books that are out there and certainly with all the new um the films that had come out in the, the early 2000s of the, the, the um, prequel trilogy um and then up to the to the modern day this is the um the macy's day parade where it's, it's become a much bigger uh force within uh you know 
than what it is. I'm the guy sort of right here in the in the middle. Um, that was that was quite a fun experience. Um, the other interesting thing about what the 501st is, as it, be, as it has grown bigger and bigger, um, the you know the studio behind Star Wars took notice. This is a um, and it, it sort of presents an interesting conundrum for them because like you know these are people who are not Lucasfilm employees representing our brand. How do we make sure that they sort of behave um, and um, you know represent the the uh, you know represent us in a, in a good way? Yes, we were not we were not armed. Um, first of all, it was uh, middle of New York City. This was uh, 2021. Um, the Macy's Day Parade. Um, they didn't want us to carry guns. I'm very glad we didn't. Um, I personally am not a fan of carrying them around in a lot of public appearances. But also, it was a it was a two or three mile march, and you know it gets it gets heavy after a little while. <laughs> I also had um, about a hundred meters into the into the march, I heard a loud pop. Um, the strap that was holding my thigh plate had come undone, and I had to sort of spend half the parade sort of holding it up with hand um, before they could tape it back onto me. Um, anyway, so um, sort of going back to like the early days of the 501st, um, the Lucasfilm became aware of the 501st because they had been going to some of the conventions at Dragon Con, and, and they sent the guy who was their their head of fan relations, Steve Stansweet out to meet, um, you know, meet them and sort of just get a sense of like, what are these guys doing? And um, he met with them and basically, you know, they laid down some initial ground rules. Like, you know, we're not gonna sell, you know, don't sell merchandise, um, you know, in your name that, you know, that would that'd be, that was a no-go. You know, try to, you know, stay in character and don't do like all these, you know, some, there's some, some initial limits on like what types of events we could do. And it's become a little bit more stringent ever since Disney took over. Um, but like this, there, there's, there's been this mutual understanding between um, the uh, fi, uh, the five hundred first and, and, and Lucasfilm, just trying to you know understand how we both can help each other without sort of trying to um, you know I don't know say they, they basically have Lucasfilm shut us down. So on the other hand, on the other side, they can basically have a pool of, of people with costumes that they can draw on for any number of things. Um, like the Macy's Day Parade. Um, that we've had some people who have done commercials um, and some of our members have showed up in um, productions like the uh, uh, the Mandalorian um, at the end of season one. There's this scene where there's a whole lot of stormtroopers. A lot of those were 501st members that they had um, brought on as, as paid extras. Um, I'd say, say the um, Obi-Wan Kenobi um, series has a bunch of, a bunch of our stormtroopers. Um, in there as well and then actually one of the, a couple of the stunt actors are also Bible first members and this is also a conduit for people to join the film industry um we there's a whole bunch of, of of fans um i mentioned Sherilyn lambeth earlier she she had actually become uh, worked on star trek for a little while um and we've got uh, there's some Bible first members who have gone from the Bible first to work for disney or to work in the the the, the costuming industry for hollywood um and yeah in this what this represents for fandom and you know this this type of fandom is it, it, it's a really interesting moment between who the, the, the basically the property owners of these big franchises and um the fans who are really you know you know helping to sort of promote it you know through this grassroots way um some studios are better about this than others um uh, bruce just mentioned um you know paramount and star trek you know there there is a, a little bit more bad blood there um, and this is sort of this, this, there's always been this sort of uneasy relationship between the, you know, folks who are making these types of costumes and the, the folks who own them. Um, going back to the, the mid 1990s, um, with the replica props forum, you had people who, um, I, I spoke with a guy named Art Andrews who owns the site. And he was explaining to me that there was a lot of misunderstanding between the folks who were making these conventions and or sorry, making these costumes and trying to sell parts. Um, and they were frequently getting shut down on, um, you know, like whatever like sales listings there were, they'd be, get, they'd be sent cease and desist letters. Um, in some cases, people were really abusing this. Um, there, was, there was one guy who was make a, a guy named Marco up in Toronto who was making, just churning out Stormtrooper armor. And Lucasfilm um, basically said, stop, this is our IP and you're not, you, you haven't licensed it. And he, as it was, he was explained, um, as it was explained to me, he did not cease and desist. So they basically 
hit him with some very onerous fines and he eventually destroyed his molds and and sort of left the industry um with england it's a little bit of a different situation but it's it also different but similar um it was the guy who actually molded the armor in the first place for the original for the original films um and in the i would say the 2000s he started selling he still had the molds and was basically like well i can you know i can sell these and lucasfilm was like please don't do that um and I, it ended up going to court and it basically i think the the uk um the uk supreme court or, or some court ruled that he had actually held the right to he had designed them and he had the mold so he could actually go ahead and, and do that um you can still buy that armor it's a, it's it's a, it's a you know as close to screen use as you can get um you cannot buy it in the u.s um <laughs> you can buy it in the uk um but anyway like with, with the well part of how this has, has how this had changed is art andrews um as he was explaining it to me, he had spoken, um, you know, he, he was based in Las, Las Vegas, and this is where a lot of the, the studios had their lawyers going for um, merchandising conventions. And they basically started, started just meeting with some of these folks. And they, it was a, these face-to-face -face conversations just to hang out and like, oh, all right, we, now we understand what you're doing when you're dressing up in these costumes. You're not actually trying to like, you know, infringe on our property. Um, you're, you're actually just fans. And on the fan side, it's like, oh, okay, we see what the, what your concerns are, we will sort of adhere to some of these, you know, like like sort of like what Lucasfilm and and the Power First had come to is like these are these sort of unspoken agreements about what can you do and what can you make, um, and it's it's still a little bit of a gray area as far as like you know fair use and, and copyright goes, but as long as people are sort of um, you know behaving, I think that studios are willing to let people you know play as their characters because they they. Can use them as in the final first case they can use them as as advertising or just sort of a you know look how passionate our fans are um and uh so that's sort of how that um that has gone over the years um or shift focus a little bit you know we've gotten up into the to the modern a, a bit more of the modern environment and so part of what part of what i look at in the book is some of the technological stuff that has taken place in order to you know continue to advance uh cosplay in, into the in the um in the public's mind um a, a big part I, I don't have a slide for it because it's kind of hard to or kind of weird to put like a, a screenshot of facebook or something but you know social media was a, is a huge way to get the word out about this and and i sort of started to notice how this has changed um through my experience but like when facebook became a, a big force online it 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 doesn't really discriminate who sees you uh, and what you're posting. So if you go to a convention, you're posting up a picture of a, of a costume you're in, um, your, cos your costuming friends will certainly see it, but your grandma will see it, your coworkers will see it, your family members, your high school friends. And that sort of uh, helps bring out cosplay to a much wider audience than it had ever really gone to before. Uh, you know, before you might have, you might have only, the folks who might have known that you're doing it would be, you know, within the sort of fandom parts of your life. Um, this helps to expand that out quite a bit more. And you have social networks like Twitter and Instagram, uh, nowadays TikTok and, and others that really help to, to um, blow up um, th this, this vocation for a, a much wider audience. Um, and along the way, you also have these other, you know, big, big screen appearances. Um, I like to point to the Big Bang Theory, um, not not necessarily a great show but it was a normally popular show and you have you know these guys who are going to conventions and doing all the nerd stuff that people are like oh i guess that's you know i guess that's what some people can do and i kind of like that idea and you know i haven't dressed up in costumes since halloween so maybe i'll try this and, and i i think that it's, it's just one thing that it you know the all these little elements together has helped to sort of bring costume a little costuming a little bit more to the forefront um, and then other technological things that have happened, uh, 3D printing was a, was a big one. Um, a uh, you know, big part of that is the price of 3D printers have, has come down significantly. Um, patents, uh, the, the, the initial technologies had been patented in the 1980s. And as those patents have begun to expire, you start to see the price on a printer come down. Um, I've got a snap maker in my basement that was just a couple hundred bucks. Uh, years before it was just it would have been an unthinkable expense but you know people can sometimes you know a, a couple hundred dollar printers 
cheaper than a multi-thousand dollar printer. So you, it's much easier to have one in your home. And people have started to really, um, you know, add these to their arsenal of, of costume making um, activities. Um, all the all the the characters here are all three D printed. Um, the the one in the middle is a little bit more obvious. You can still see print lines on their stuff, but um, the two troopers, you know, I, I was chatting with them. Like these are um, co costumes that they had they had printed up um, in their home. Um, the short trooper on the, the right is, is I make a special a, a case of because um, one I, I dress up as a as a short trooper, um, but one of the it, it's an interesting case study because what had happened is that there's a guy um, named Sean Fields who really liked the, how it looked, um, and before Rogue One came out, he basically looked at the images that had been seen at, in the trailers and um, some of the leaked photos, and then um, pictures that people had taken at uh, Star Wars Celebration in. 2016, so it was the summer of 2016, um, they had the Lucasfilm trotted out three of the three of the troopers, and people took pictures from all angles. Um, he went and modeled the armor completely, um, from head to toe, and put the files up online for free. And um, you know, there's a there's a, a, several Facebook groups that popped up around them to build these troopers before the films came out. So people were building, um, were you know, buying printers and figuring out how to all right, how do I print these characters up? And I think that uh, in, a, in a lot of ways that has helped keep this character around. It um, has since appeared in um, the new Andor series, but also the Mandalorian. Um, I think in part because, you know, it's a recognizable character and, and with, especially within Star Wars fandom, people have been able to continue to replicate it. And, um, you know, it, it, I think that that staying power comes because, you know, fans really like, like the, to build them and they can recognize them. Formats. Um, this was another sort of technological uh, thing, and, and it's basically, um, you know, people finding really unique ways to to build, um, you know, ca uh, characters. Um, this this came out of the anime scene, especially in the 1990s. People were looking at um, there there was a a, a poster um, by the name of Penwiper online who had come across. Who had she had basically put together, or she or they um, had put together these tutorials on like, you know, this is how you can use these really inexpensive uh, floor mats to make complex shapes. And if you hit it with a little bit of heat, you can mold it, you can cut it into any shape you want, you can carve them and, and add them in different angles, and you can come up with these really cool um, and really detailed characters. And it has become a, a revolutionary thing for the for the the cosplay world because you can make these really complex types of uh, sets of armor, but also not, you don't necessarily need a 3D printer. You don't need access to, you know, a, like a workshop where you have, might have, you know, you could fiberglass something or, or make it out of um, ABS plastic. Um, a Stormtrooper will run you, at least when I started, it was about 500 bucks, and, you know, anywhere from 500 to a thousand dollars. You know, this is, you know, the, that's, that puts it out of reach for a lot of people. And um, what I think um, cause what what uh, you know EVA foam does is it really helps sort of lower the ground floor for access into this hobby, and I think that's an incredibly important thing for people to um, you know to to recognize it because it, it really helps um, more people join, um, especially if you are not if you don't have access to a workshop, if you don't have access to the money to buy a whole bit a whole bit of uh, 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 like a start set of starter armor or commission somebody to build you a really, um, you know, a, a high-end suit, you can go through and, and make something out of this. And it, it's, um, there's, you know, no end to what you can build with it. Uh, um, is with enough time and practice and paint and Bondo and everything else that goes into it. Um, the uh, the Xenomorph, I, I would really love just because it, it's, um, you know, it, it sort of shows that you don't necessarily need to go full screen accurate to make a character that looks just, you know, really pops out. They, they did a really great job with that. And then the, the, the woman in the center um, who did the, the droid from uh, uh, Ned from uh, Obi-Wan did a, uh, a, a really great job just, you know, putting it together. Um, yeah, uh, um, floor mats have been around for a while. I know, I know this, this sort of technique had come around in the, um, in the mid 2000s. Um, and I um, interviewed Adam Savage of Mythbusters came for this book, and he was saying that um, professional um, prop makers and costume designers had been using um, different types of foam for a long, a little bit longer, but you know, before that, um, this is just sort of how it transitioned into the, sort of the fan spaces. 
And then another element to this is just buying stuff online. Um, the, before, like when I started doing this um, back in 2000, I had to sort of know a person, know who knew a person. Um, and then I had to basically send a check out to them and hope that it, it wasn't being, I wasn't being scammed. Uh, what the internet has done is it has also helped sort of open this barrier, you know, you know, lower the, the lower the barriers to access for a lot of ways. Um, because, you know, now you can, sometimes the stuff is licensed and you can just buy it just outright. Um, the, the Stormtrooper on the left here is a, is a, uh, a Novos kit that I built. Um, or no, the helmet's in the Novos. The rest of it's an MTK um, suit of armor. Uh, but that was the, the one I had built. But you could buy an Novos kit just off their website. And it was like a high quality, super sharp uh, arm. The plastic was cut a little bit, or was, was a little bit too thin for my liking. Um, but it was a really, it was a really clean suit, and they basically sold it for. They initially sold it for 250 bucks, then they went up to 500 when they officially released it. Um, that led to a huge number of people joining the Bible first in the first place. Um, but even if it's not officially licensed, the, uh, that's me in the middle. I'm I'm dressed up as a rebel pilot from Rogue One. Um, there's a this is from a an outfit called Imperial Boots. Um, they're based in China, and they make these high quality replica costumes. And make it extraordinarily easy to buy. Um, you put in your credit card, input all your sizing like you would a normal store, and they basically um, they do a wave, and then they'll they will um, once that wave closes, they put out the orders to whatever factories they've they've licensed stuff out from, and uh, or they, they've made a contract with them. You soon uh, get it in the mail. Um, the helmet was a, is another thing. Um, I bought it off of a maker on Etsy. Um, and, Got the package in the mail and put it together, and um, you know it was it was a lot simpler than sort of um, you know having to go to a forum and sort of having to know the right people, and um, it just it just streamlined the whole process. And and some people just don't really want to do that, so it it, it you know it makes it a lot easier for people to join, especially if they if they're not really interested in like going to cons all the time, but they want a stormtrooper or they want some other costume. And then the Spider Man on the on the right, that's my son. Um, um, I bought that off of Amazon. And, um, you know, I would have killed to have had a costume like that as a kid. It was, you know, um, it just looked fantastic. He had a lot of fun with it and then he outgrew it and we're waiting for his little sister who is currently Spider-Man obsessed to, to grow into it. Um, so the ease of access of, of online shopping has really also helped. And, and this doesn't extend, this isn't just with, um, you know, full costumes, um, you know, getting materials or, or getting um, just com individual components you know, the, 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 the online revolution has really helped there as well. Um, so that's sort of the end of what I had prepared. I guess, uh, does anybody have questions? Um, there's, this has sort of been, a, a, again, a very broad overview of, of, of stuff that's in the book, but there's certainly lots of other nooks and crannies that we mm -hmm. can talk about. I also need to take a drink, so stay by. <laughs> uh, the first question that we have is from Tina Riggs. She wanted to know whether the 501st still or ever gets angry when they see people doing mashup costumes from Star Wars. Yeah, so that, it's an interesting thing. The 501st Legion is a fairly stringent thing. And I think I've had some people yell at me about talking about cosplay in 501st because, well, the 501st is snobby and, and what the, which my answer is, yeah, we kind of are because we have a, a set of entry requirements. Um, the, the initial goal for the for the group was to to present the characters as they as though they could step off the screen, and within the group there is a there is an entire gamut of, of attitudes. I sort of I'm I'm on the the end of well it, it looks good enough um, you know the general public isn't really going to care, and there but there are people who I I've talked to and, and and spoke with over the years who are like you know they are full on like if it's not 100% screen accurate it's not worth doing. Um, the, so the final first doesn't really, the final first doesn't really permit a lot of customization within its, you know, within its ranks. Um, you know, there's a little bit of variation here and there. Um, but some, some folks are, are more, you know, they're, they're also members of the rebel legion, which is our, our good guy counterparts. And I'm also, also a member of that, uh, with, with the rebel, with the rebel, um, pilot that I've got and the clone trooper, weirdly enough. Um, so with the Rebel Legion, it allows for a little bit more customization. Like you can, you can, like Jedi will have, you know, there's sort of 
certain requirements. They ha the minimum requirements that you have to have. They can, you know, if you have a pilot, you can change the helmet around or um, Jedi, you can come up with backstories or names and things like that. So there's a little bit more freewheeling than the 501st is. Um, and then you've got another group called the Mandalorian Mercs, which is, um, you know, custom Mandalorians. Um, and predating the Mandalorian TV show, um, you know, some 501st Mandalor some 501st members would would refer to them as, as trash can Mandos because they thought that they kind of looked dumb, or they would have literally assembled their their armor out of uh, seg uh, you know plastic panels from from trash cans. Um, that group has sort of upped its standards a little bit more, um, and certainly with the with the TV shows now, there's there's a little bit more. Um, I don't want to say like there's there's a little bit more screen guidance for what you can do, um, and yeah, like these uh, as, as Bruce just mentioned, they're not they're not really for con, con, conformists, but like um, you know, I, I think people also like to you know uh, you know experiment with the costumes and like certainly with with um, you know Mandalorian armor, you can do you can customize it to your heart's content. And what I like to tell people is that the 501st is not the end all and be all of Star Wars costuming. If you want to make a if you want to make a a stormtrooper and, and jazz it up with all sorts of colors or, or or make your own custom characters you know more power to you and i think that the attitudes have really changed as far as you know you know how willing you know you know folks will be for you know showing up in in, in character for some of those costumes certainly with conventions i don't think anybody cares um i went to star wars celebration last year and there was certainly a lot of um one of the cooler costumes i saw was um, a couple friends had made these mashup of these trooper types, they had like a stormtrooper helmet, but they had um, mixed around different armor pieces and it looked really cool. Um, but it, you know, it's not something that like the 501st might not permit at, a, at an official event where we're invited. Um, so like it, that range of, of events that we go to also really, I think helps, you know, cater toward, toward sort of towards what we're gonna be dressing up as. Like, you know, if you're going to a movie premiere or um, if you're, if, or for if being hired as an extra, you know, we're going to have, you know, people are going to have certain expectations for what they want to see. If you're at a convention, you know, it's all sort of no holds barred, if that makes, like, if that makes sense. Um, and the other thing here is like, you know, a lot of Final First people, like, you know, we also do other types of costumes as well. Like, like there's, it, you know, being in the Final First does not preclude you from dressing up as other things. And certainly over the years, people will get tired of wearing Stormtrooper armor or other Final First costumes and they will go into branch into other things. So I've, I've got friends who have sort of gone through phases where they've done, um, when Dread came out, there were, there was a whole bunch of them went as, as judges. Um, Ghostbusters is certainly a perennial favorite um, and, and so forth. All right, I think who else? Um, Ann Davenport wanted to know how much does the book cover costumes recreating characters from science fiction and fantasy books as opposed to other forms of media yeah it, it sort of covers a good swath of, of sci-fi fandom um and there was a couple of pictures that i really wanted to include but i could never figure out who had the you know who i could get the pictures from there's a, there a great uh, recreation of a robert a robert heinlein novel um certainly uh and, and this is sort of one of the things with the the early science fiction fantasy days um you know, you didn't have a lot of the screen references that we have today to, to work off of. So there, I want to say that like cosplay is a little bit more freewheeling, you know, you know, in, in a broader sense um, with with what people could make and what they're imagining. Um, certainly in, some, in those early um, uh, in those early years, you know, people were, were dressing up as sort of archetypes or, or these very sort of interpretational things. Um, and even nowadays, you, I, I start to see a lot of people dressing up in characters from books, um, especially, I think this is partially due to, um, you know, Instagram and TikTok. There's a, oh, I don't know if I have a copy of it anymore. Um, uh, Gideon the Ninth is a, is a science fiction fantasy, um, uh, sorry, a science fantasy book that came out a couple of years ago, and it, it's got like this, um, um, you sort of have the, the, the character on the cover, uh, there, there's their face sort of painted like a skull. And I've seen a lot of people dress up as that character. And there's some other other instances of that that have popped up recently. And I think it's not so much um, that there's a lot of screen accurate images of those characters, but it, it's that there's enough description and there's enough passion for the character that people are able to sort of dress up. And I think that's that's certainly existed throughout, you know, this, this history. Um, I think that with 
with the the increase that you know we have Star Trek and Star Wars and all the other the other franchises come out, you know, it makes it it certainly makes it easier to sort of um, work off of what you've seen um, and then sort of um, go from there, if that makes sense. So, uh, Phil wants to your opinion on um, the current difficulty he's noticed is printed fabrics worn by movie superheroes. Do you think that was done partially just to make it more difficult for cosplayers to make their own costumes? <laughs> I think, I mean, certainly Hollywood productions have access to a big budget so they, they can make stuff um, a little bit easier. I mean, I, I've seen fans and a friend of mine, um, uh, Amy Dansby, has done some print, some 3D printing on fabric. Um, and I've seen people do some neat things with um, like, printing scale like, like printing like scale armor onto stuff um i think like you know hollywood and and like because they have those resources they have they can really pioneer a lot of stuff and they can do some stuff that is you know you don't usually see you know you, you don't really see coming out of the fan community but like the fan fan community is really good at reverse engineering a lot of the stuff so i think that in a lot of cases it's like oh challenge accepted let's let's see how we can do this and i i've certainly seen um uh, like pe people have designed some of their costumes along the same lines of, of how um, you know film film studios will design these costumes. Kylo, like the, the Kylo Ren costume from The Force Awakens and the, the sequel trilogy, um, you have like it it is basically like a vest, and then they actually the arms are separate. It makes it easier for the actors to get in and out of stuff or to cool down or whatever. And I've seen people sort of replicate those those things in general. In other cases, I think like just the if you look at the, the new stormtroopers versus the old stormtroopers, the older ones are really super simple. Um, you just have um, ABS plastic that's been vacuum formed um, over a black body suit, whereas the my first order trooper is a pain in the ass to wear because it, it's um, it's got a lot of plates that kind of fit together kind of differently and weirdly. Um, but also, I have these extra sleeves of like um, of ribbing and that adds extra texture. So I've got them on my elbows my shoulders and my knees and it's basically like wearing an extra set of sleeves underneath um this already i think that the armor itself is about 50 pounds of fiberglass so i'm wearing it like i already have a bodysuit that is not entirely the most breathable thing and i'm putting extra sleeves on top of it that is really only a cost if i try to bring out in the winter time um oh if, if i'm outside in the summer and it's not like blazingly hot it's, it's, i'll wear it but it's, it's uh sometimes more trouble than it's worth whereas my 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 OG Stormtrooper, like that's something I can just throw on and you know dance around in and and not have to worry about how long I'm I'm in it just because it's so easy to put on. So, um, a yeah. philosophical Sorry, question off, but... from Betsy Marks: mm -hmm. What's the deep attraction to always wanting to portray the bad guys? They've got the cooler costumes, <laughs> um, and I, I don't. I have a very distinct memory of coming home from seeing Star Wars in the, the special edition. Um, my, my dad took me and I, and, you know, apparently my jaw was on the floor the whole time. And I just I have this distinct memory of really thinking that the stormtroopers were just, they just looked cool. Like it, they, uh, they just, it is something about the design really just sort of popped out. And I've always, I always wanted to wear one. Um, and, you know, it, it's, you know that dressing up as a bad guy certainly brings up some odd discussions with people every now and then because it's like you know, oh you're you're representing the fascists or the bad guys and yeah there it, it that's a whole it's a it's the longer conversation about like you know how do we you know what are we fans of when we when we're looking at these characters um certainly like i when i dress up as a stormtrooper i'm not a um you know advocating for galactic fascism <laughs> it, it's more just like you know i'm, I'm trying to I, I like star wars itself so that's sort of what i'm i'm bringing to the table um and you know I, there's a reason why I, I picked up a rebel pilot you know over the last couple of years because you know sometimes i want to sort of portray the good guy um so it, it's it, yeah I, I guess that's sort of like my roundabout answer of, of saying that you know that there's a um you know, there, there, there can be some complexities in, in, in the types of costumes that you're wearing. 
And, you know, there's, there's some historical stuff that goes into this. I mean, certainly the, the Star Wars costumes for the Empire were based off of Nazi uniforms. Um, there's certainly things that I am, especially after watching and the, the new series Andor, I'm certainly not interested in wearing uh, it, it, an Imperial officer costume anytime soon. Um, and we had a like uh, one example that sort of ties in with this is we had a, a guy uh, in our, our local group who wanted to make like a like a flag holder uh, that had the imperial logo on it that was this sort of like a stanchion with that you'd have like a sort of a vertical flag. And I've seen these I've seen pictures of people who, who they, they'll basically walk around a convention and have like a little like a stormtrooper parade around the con. But like you know it, it, it's one of the things that I pointed out in our forums like you know it's very very close to what you know Nazis were were walking around Germany in. and it's just it's not something that I would if if I saw if if I was at a con and I saw it walking around it's not something I would personally want to like be following around. I think it's, it's still an ongoing conversation for a lot of people. Um, and certainly like, you know, trying to dress up as a bad guy is, is, is it's always worth having that in the back of your mind is, is, you know, what are you portraying? Like, how are you, how are you presenting yourself along the same lines? It's, it's, it's my reluctant. I like, I'm pretty reluctant to carry a, a replica gun around. Um, one of my, my worst fears um, when I was uh, in charge of the green mountain squatter and, and the final first, uh, the NAG, you know, what happens if, somebody sees us carrying around a gun doesn't know what we're doing and like calls the SWAT team on us. Um, you know, there's that sort of personal safety thing. Um, but also after like the shooting in Aurora, Colorado, you know, there's a lot, like a lot of theaters basically said, please leave those at home. Um, you know, certainly for school events, we don't bring them. Um, and just generally in public, like if, if the, if the general public doesn't know what we're doing, it's best to sort of err on the side of caution. And, um, you know, like, like for a convention, like I'm a little bit more, I'm a little bit more um, comfortable, you know, bringing a, a blaster with me, but like, you know, outside, not not so much. That's sort of my rambly answer for that. Um, Bruce mentioned about reenactors for for Southern armies. Um, I think that there's a there's certainly a long ongoing conversation about that. And you know, um, I, I had a friend who dressed up as German um, uh, German infantry during uh, from World War II for reenacting, and and I you know asked him a little bit about that at, at times. And, um, you know, they're, they're trying to, they're, they're in those instances, they're trying to sort of bring a level of historical accuracy to it. You can't have, um, you know, if, if you're, if you're staging a mock battle, you want to have people that you can fight against, or you can explain, you know, like, um, a little bit about the history, but again, it, it's sort of these ongoing conversations, um, that you have to have. And I, I know at least from my conversations with him, like they were like, yeah, there's absolutely no Nazis are allowed to be joining us to do this. Like they, and they were like anybody who started to sort of talk about like, you know, sort of the whataboutism there, they would like shut that down really quickly. I don't know what the extent for like Confederate soldiers are these days. Although, a, you know, a friend of mine who I interviewed for the book, he does Union Union and Confederate um, uh, surgeons. And he would, he would sort of talk about like, you know, how there's a lot of research that would go into it and sort of trying to understand those soldiers' experiences. Um, so like, you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of nuance to these things, I, I think. So. Unless you have anything else. Go ahead. Ask it. Okay. The last question that I have seen come across that is in any way different from the previous ones. <laughs> does your book cover the infamous period in the 1970s and 80s when there was a trend for women to wear skimpier and skimpier costumes in order to win those contests? Yeah, I touched on it a little bit. Um, and, there, and it's just something that it's it also extends into the modern day is like sort of like the, the um, I, I know that some cons have basically said you need to be wearing a costume and, and having no cost, no, no clothing is not necessarily a costume. Um, I also know about the, the peanut butter incident that happened a while back. Um, there, and this is something that is, is pretty interesting to me just in that, like there's, there's a lot of ranges that a lot of things that cosplay can be used for. And certainly you, if you go back to the source material and the way that women are depicted on covers of books, the science fiction fantasy books, you know, there, there is, um, you know, not a lot left to the imagination when it comes to like what, what publishers thought would sell copies. Um, and I think that there's, that's been something that has persisted throughout Hollywood and, and storytelling history is, is like, you know, how are women depicted on screen? In some cases, you know, not very, you know, not wearing very much. Certainly, the, the history of comics is is um, has, you know, does a lot with that. And uh, and then I think that when you are working off of source material, you sort of 
if you're trying to go for a screen accurate or a cover accurate look, you know, you're going to try to, you know, you have be constrained by those images and, and how those uh, those folks are dressed. Um, that has certainly changed a little bit over the time. Um, and, you know, certainly with the modern cosplay world, like, you know, you have people who are, you know, able to, you know, sort of flip that into a, you know, a viable career for themselves. Um, you know, platforms like OnlyFans um, have a lot, let people who are, you know, cosplayers to, um, you know, use you know sell images of themselves and, and to sort of um go even skimpier or have or you know sort of imagine you know characters in um you know sexualized ways um as a career and and i don't really think that there's anything wrong with that as, as long as everybody's consenting um but certainly it, it's it's a thing that has persisted throughout like the history of of, of science fiction fandom um is you know just you know how are how are women portrayed and how are they um um, used in stories, and I think that that has also changed quite a bit over the years. As you know, people have um, tried to be a little bit more sensitive about it, and to be uh, you know to focus on m making better, better costumes, better um, characters and roles for for women on on screen and on in comics and, and whatnot. And I think it's something that's going to continue to evolve over time. Um, then, if that all makes sense, putting on your uh futurist hat people you know cosplayers can build just about anything they want to these days there's sort of no technological limits that last very long so where do you see cosplay going with sort of the the main challenges of how do i build this going away That's a really good question and yeah I, I i don't i don't know that we'll see like another advance like a you know massive advance in like like the 3d printing um I would not be surprised if something like that comes about at all. But um, certainly, that we're going to see ref when, it, when it comes to three D printing, we're going to see ref we've like ever since I finished the book, there's been refinements. Um, when I had when I was writing the book, um, you know, the types of three D printers that were, and this is just one example um, that have been were around were extruded plastic. Um, the types of machine, the prices continue to come down. They are becoming much much more. They're, they're coming faster they're becoming a you know they, they can do a, a new level of um of accuracy that was beyond like sort of like the one that i have um and certainly you're like there there's the the resin um the resin printers that are, are coming online now um you can make some extraordinarily beautiful prints off of some of those things um I'm trying to, there's an example I saw just the other day, like uh, I, I follow a whole bunch of cosplayers on Instagram um, and like some of them are printing out these helmets that like you pop it, you, you, you just print up the whole thing and you, you don't even have to like finish it. Like you can just hit it with a sander, like a really light sanding and it'll be like perfect. Um, same thing with like props and, and things like that. Like with them, um, uh, oh, I don't have one on, I don't have one within like arm's reach of here um like like with like some of the stuff like like this is not a really good example but i have like a a, a really shitty um maltese falcon that i had bought off offline and it's it's really kind of crummy but if i was to like 3d print this like they're kind of hard to see but there's lots of little details here um this is something i would probably want to resin print because you you have like the the printing lines on here you'd have to really spend a lot of time sanding it down and, and trying to make it so that you don't have those those imperfections. Um, it's like resin printing will really sort of get away from that. Um, so I think that we'll see more advances there, um, certainly with like the size and, and size that, you know, is available to hobbyists um, is a big thing. Laser printers is another thing that I've sort of, or sorry, laser cutters is something that I've, I've seen um, more and more people use, um, and especially with like foam. If you can like, um, you know, use a, a laser cutter to really precisely cut stuff. Um, there's been some really cool things that I've seen people make. Um, I saw somebody make a chain mail using sheets of EVA foam where they cut it in a certain pattern and you just pop it out and it's basically this really lightweight, very quick to, um, um, to, to make stuff. And also if you're making costume parts that are really, um, you know, need some like really fine measurements and things. Um, so I think that like, that's, a, that's a big thing there. Um, the other thing is like, you know, we don't have any end to like the, the types of franchises that people, the cosplayers are really attracted to. So like, you know, we've got, you know, new Game of Thrones stuff. We've got Marvel is going to have a gazillion more things. There's going to be a gazillion more Star Wars things, Star Trek um, shows. 
and who else who knows what's coming down the pipeline um so i think that there's certainly going to be no lack of inspiration there um and the, like some of the technological things that have come about like like youtube as a platform like that is a really invaluable thing because of what you have on youtube is that you have like a, a repository of knowledge like if you want to like if i want to learn how to to do foam making you know or to make something out of foam like a specific piece or something i can just go google that or search that in, in, in youtube and find like a ton of tutorials um that's actually how i made um this this guy right here um i had i had not i i'm I've not done a lot with foam, but um, I'd wanted to do some practice just sort of get a better sense of it. And like, I basically copied this out of a, um, a comic book that I had been reading um, Baker, called Baker Queen. Um, it was made into a, into a, uh, a TV show on the sci-fi channel. Didn't use this quick version, but like um, I wanted to sort of figure out how to do foam making. So I basically I, I just went to YouTube and, and found it. So I think that there's gonna be like, that's certainly not gonna go away. And, and there's certainly always videos that are being added to that with new tutorials and tips and tricks on how to do stuff um and i think that you know there's also probably um you know like major studios are like are licensing this stuff a little bit more frequently um certain and certainly there's there's avenues that we can sort of take advantage of there I, i'd be interesting to see like what how I, I mentioned before that we're really good at um reverse engineering stuff especially like hollywood techniques so i'll be interested to see like what types of things studios are doing that you know if the price comes down on like you know screen um you know doing a little bit of 3d printing on on fabric or something if that if that becomes a little bit more commonplace um certainly i know like the the um some of the, the strange new world cosplayers would probably appreciate that because i was looking at some of those costumes and man that would be a pain to do <laughs> do you see cosplay ever breaking out of its sci-fi fantasy roots and going out to things like historical and other things like that? Oh, I think it already has. I mean, it's certainly, um, there's certainly more avenues for it. I think that's, I, I think that's like the biggest thing here is and sort of what I was trying to get to with the book is like, how does like, you know, this has become so much more mainstream than when I started, certainly from when it, when it originally started. Um, you know, seeing people dressing up in characters is not like quite as like, oh, what's that weird person doing? It's like, oh, that person, like, like, you know, that person's doing cosplay. Um, so like part of that like you know there, there are conventions every single weekend of the year all over the united states um and they're they're easy to sort of set up and, and and like you know you have either like library events like your local library might be doing one your local library might have a 3d printer uh, and that's another way to um that sort of breaks this out in the open um and certainly like there's there's elements of like of where cosplay and, and sort of fan oriented stuff breaks into fashion um, sort of towards the end of the book, I, I talk a little bit about like how, you know, you are see, starting to see clothing that is really tailored after, you know, it's not cosplay, but it looks costume like, like I've got a sweatshirt that is um, patterned after uh, Boba Fett's armor. And it's a, um, you know, it, it's got cloth that's been sewn in such a way that it looks like bits of armor and stuff. It's, it's my favorite sweatshirt in the world. Um, enough that I, I ended up buying a, a, a backup on eBay a couple of years ago when mine event, event inevitably falls apart. Um, but like, you know, I've also got like a, a winter jacket from Columbia that came out um, in conjunction with uh, Rogue One that's, that sh um, looks like Cassian Andor's uh, blue jacket. And it, it's got like all these details and stuff. And it looks, it's a really nice, it's a really, really nice jacket. Um, and it looks a little bit like a costume. Like it, it's really well built and it, and it has all these features that are like that and you, and you are starting to see i think some clothing companies that are really sort of um you know, catering to fans who want to sort of add a little bit more to the of the you know science fiction fandom elements to their lives um there was one company i just saw that they're doing some sort of star trek jack like a light jacket that looks kind of neat um but also like the, there's just like this plethora of companies that will screen print pictures of everything like this the shirt i'm wearing is is a, a pure and clean from the expanse like you can find like replica shirts that characters wear pretty quickly and um you know the, the, i think that that's an element of how this sort of you know continues to sort of break into mainstream awareness like as people are fans of stuff like you can certainly find no end of marvel or um uh star wars or star trek you know type you know tie-in things like that and certainly with like um i think with like uh 
uh, what is it? It's uh, The Last of Us, the new HBO show that just premiered. Um, I got an ad served to me on Instagram where um, the company that made the jacket that he, that the, the main character is wearing, like, yep, yeah, we made that jacket. You can buy it, and you know, you know, it'll be screen accurate. Like, they didn't use the, the term screen accurate, but the the implication was like, if you want to dress up like a character, you can buy our jacket because it was the one that was used in the screen. And that's certainly something I think that we'll see more of as time goes on. Um, yeah, the, um, Sabrina had asked about the peanut butter. There was a guy who dressed up as peanut butter, the, the human turd or the turd, and I, I think it was um, San Diego Comic Con. Um, and he was basically covered himself in peanut butter and after a couple of hours under hot lights, it turned rancid and it got everywhere. And I think that ever since then it's been banned as a, as a costuming substance. <laughs> um, so, but I, I could be mistaken on where that was, but where, where that was, so someone, someone's also saying Worldcon, but I, I, pre, I thought I had read that it was, that was in, um, it was, Scott, it was Scott Shaw at Worldcon. Okay, uh, there was a, maybe that book that I was looking at was a little bit wrong. Yeah. Um, Jennifer Sorsky had a question too that she posted. Um, can you see it there? Um, I see Bruce's question. Interesting discussion. So do you think there day. might be a backlash at some point to the technology with people going back to the harder way of doing things, laser cut from foam chain mail, going mm. back to handmade from metal wire chain mail? I think that. I don't think there'll be a backlash. I think that what hap what we'll see is that you know people will integrate technologies as um, you know as they find them to be useful. Um, and certainly, like there's the technical challenge of making something. So I've I've certainly seen people who have um, commissioned you know commissioned stuff, and then decided like you know all right for my next one I'm going to try to build this. Because like, you know, and I, I think that might be a, a, a bit more of a common thing for people to do nowadays is like to, you know, like with Imperial Boots, with my, my X-Wing pilot, sorry, I'm looking over to my side because I have my X-Wing helmet over there. Um, you know, it, it's easy to, you know, commission um, the, you know, or, or to buy like a, a complete X-Wing pilot costume from Imperial Boots when it comes time to make another one, like, well, maybe I want the challenge of making something for myself or learning new skills. I, and I think one of the, the key components of the cosplay world is just this, this intense set of, cur uh, you know, being curious and wanting to solve problems. And so, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to, um, you know, just commission something or, or buy something or, or, or um, 3D print something. You might want to go like, all right, I want to learn how to do, um, you know, I want to learn how to, you know, make this. This this thing X, X Y or Z. Um, a really good example that I have is a, a, a good friend of mine, Bob Govier, um, who is uh, a fellow Five First member, or a, I don't know if he's still the First. He he was a the ex the CEO of the NEG for a long time. Um, he the the Clone Wars TV series had just come out, and his daughter was the right age, so he's like, all right, I want to make her an Ahsoka Tano costume. And so he went and tried to figure out like, all right, how do I make like the, the her head tails. And then that sort of got him down the rabbit hole of, all right, so like I made this for her, they, they, they look good enough, but like, how do I make, like, uh, how do I make them do better the next time? And then he had somebody ask like, well, can you make me some? And he, he's had this sort of this long process of iteration. And he basically has opened up his own small effects studio where he basically is one of the guys to go to if you want to make, if you want a Soka Tano um, head tails, like, it's a, like a headdress, you, um, it's made of silk and rubber. And he he sculpts each one, um, or he, he's he's sculpted various types for each of the seasons that she showed up in, um, added in a lot of a lot of detail, and basically it, he has a, like a long backlist. And he it's just been this one this thing that he's just been able to sort of uh, iterate on and and sort of improve with time. And I've seen a lot of people sort of go down that route trying to learn. I don't know how to do this skill, but I'm gonna I can figure out how to do it, and I can continue to work on it. And, um, you know, there's, there's people who have, you know, gone and they've, they've become people that they make helmets with. I've, I've got another friend who's, who's gotten into woodworking that way. So I think that not so much, a, it's a, not so much a backlash, but like, where do, where can I challenge myself and how do I integrate this into, into a costume? Like I, for me personally, I, I, I do not know how to do a lot of 3d printing, but I've got a, a small one and I've, I've practiced a little bit here and there and, Every time I try to make something a little bit better and, um, you know, add to the types of costumes that I have. Um, 
if I taught, if I attend uh, attended a costume con. I have not. I haven't had anyone um, near me recently, but maybe at some point I will. One customer who refuses to do 3D printing. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, some people don't want to. Some people don't want to really do. You know, a, a it can, it's, it's still an expensive investment. Um, I also I, I don't really see them as shortcuts. I just see it as just another way to make stuff. Um, so um, yeah. Is there any other questions before we go? Okay. Thanks a lot, Andrew, for talking with us about cosplay. It's been really fascinating. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm thrilled to have uh, chatted with you all and to have the questions and so forth. And um, if you, anyone has other questions or about anything, feel free to get in touch through my website um, and so forth. Great.